Today, inshallah, I'm going to be talking about um, the facts or the frequently asked questions about Al-Islam. Um, as I've mentioned on the social media page, there's been a huge um, uptick in people interested in Islam. We know during Juma, and I'm going to try to remember when I say these Arabic terms to say the English terms. During our Friday prayer, which is our congregational prayer, uh, when Christians celebrate on Sunday and Jewish people celebrate on Saturday. Our day is Friday, so the larger community is here on Friday. That's what I mean by Juma. Juma means actually gathering together, and it's called Friday prayer. Uh, the name of the Friday prayer. But during our Friday prayer, we've had uh, several people who accepted uh, the religion of Al Islam. Um, I have people who call me, text me, saying they were come to coming to take the Shahadatain which is the oath that you will be taking, inshallah. Inshallah means God willing. Jihad of pain means the two oaths, right? Um, saying that you bear witness that there is no God but Allah, and you bear witness that Muhammad is his messenger. So there have been several people and family members who have reached out to me about this, reached out to me and talking to their family members who's interested in Al-Islam. Um, I'm sure it has to do with the presence of Muslims in the news and on, on social media and Ramadan, but not only are people interested in Islam, but they're interested in becoming Muslims. And so it's no surprise that that's the case. The surprise is how much fortitude it takes to come and take this shahadatain, come and take this oath, especially during the month of Ramadan. Uh, I was born Muslim. So when I was a teenager, about 13 or 14, I uh, was fasting during the month of Ramadan. And fasting from sunrise to sunset is a difficult thing to do, especially if you've never done it your entire life. So for people to come here and take the Shahada, this oath right in the middle of Ramadan is a very special thing uh, during this month. But it's also special because people are afraid to do so. Change is the scariest thing for any human being. What they've been doing their entire life, they love doing it, right? That's why they've been doing it for so long. But at some point, they realize whatever I'm doing is not right. It's not uh, my higher self. And when they determine and realize that I want to do something higher, I want to be better than I was previously, that takes a lot of courage. It also takes a lot of courage to come into these doors because people don't know what Islam is. They see it on the news, they see it on television, or their friends tell them about it, or they may read it in the newspaper or in history books, and they may give a disparaging view of what El Islam is. And people are afraid to come into the doors. They think we're doing something crazy in here. That's why I record it live so people can see all we are doing is just praising and remembering God. Uh, so that's what this Talim, which means a teaching, is about. It's about the fundamentals because so many people are interested in it. Um, I ask people who are Muslims to share this with other people because what we're going to do is really just go over the fundamentals so people who are Muslim already would already know these things. So the most important thing, first, Al-Islam is what our deen, our religion is. Um, some people say Islam, but we say more specifically Al-Islam. Islam by itself means submission to the will of God. Al-Islam Al -Islam means the submission to the will of God, meaning the submission that God gave you. Because if you're in your own house and you think about what God want me to do, you may come up with Islam or Islam, what you think Islam is. But God tells you what the submission is, right? If you wanted to honor your parents, 
You don't honor them by thinking, well, what, what should I give them? You can ask them and then give them what they want. Same thing is true of Allah. He tells you how you are supposed to properly submit to him, not what you think. It's, it's 8 billion people on earth. If all of us thought for ourselves what, how we should, 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 should submit to God, we would have 8 billion different ways we would do it. So he gives us the manner in which we are submitting to him. And the most important aspect of this religion, this deen, we call it a deen meaning a debt that you owe God. So it's not just a religion, it's a way of life. We pray as Muslims, we fast as Muslims, we give, have weddings as Muslims. Our death, our janazah, when we do our funeral, we do it in an Islamic ritual way. So everything is encompassed by this religion. It's not something that we think of whims whimsically and we decide for ourselves how we're going to do these things. So God, Allah, is the center of every single thing. If you don't get the creator right, if you don't get who the maker of us is right, then you're going to get everything else wrong. Right? So the first thing you need to know and understand is God. And we call God Allah. Um, not all of us know Arabic, right? But I'm sure every Muslim in the world knows what this is. This is uh, the Aleph, the Lambs, and the Ha. And it's, uh, the transliteration is Allah. Um, Allah means the God or the God, meaning there is no other God except him. He has no partners. He has no brothers. He has no sisters. He has no mother. He has no father. He has no partners, nothing, and no one ever is like him in any way. He is completely and totally unique. There's nothing like him, nothing at all. So if anyone says that they were God or they were like God, we do not accept that as true. It is so important to us that if you get this part wrong, you got everything else wrong. This is the most important part of this, that he didn't come in the form of a man. He didn't come in the form of a monk. He didn't come in the form of anything else. In fact, there are more people on this earth today, right now, the 8 billion people who believe that God came as a man or as a monkey or as an animal than believe that he is the one true God that is unseen, that is all-powerful, that is all-wise at all times. The reason that Allah, that God didn't come into form of a human being or an animal or something of that effect is because it would degrade or downgrade Allah. And he cannot be degraded or downgraded in any way. He is always all-powerful, all-knowing, all-wise at all times. He is never weak. He is never vulnerable. He is never able to be killed, to be hurt, to be harmed, to lose some of his knowledge, to lose some of his power ever at any time. As soon as you say he is something else, you are beginning to limit God. You're saying he can't do something. I try to liken it to if I went into, if I became an ant and went into an ant farm, then I wouldn't be able to give this speech to you now, right? I wouldn't be able to be a human being. I wouldn't be able to drive a car. So if God, the creator of all the worlds, became a human being, he would only be this tall. He would only be able to see the things around him. He would only be able to be in this vicinity at this time, right? And we can't put limits on God like that because he sees and knows all things at all times. He is also too magnificent to be in a human body. The largest human body was about, I think, eight feet tall, eight or nine feet tall <clears throat> uh, that they had in, what is that, um, uh, the Guinness Book of World Records, right? So he's this tall. He weighs 300 pounds, right? Just imagine trying to put the power of God inside of a human body. It's impossible to do. He can't be inside of this building. He's too magnificent. He's too large and, and powerful to be in this building, to be in this city, to be in this state, to be in this world. If he was to go in it, he would destroy it. In the same way if me, myself right now, my 200 pounds went inside of an ant farm, I would destroy it. Right? If you have the power and the uh, ability to create the universe, it cannot encompass you. He's too big for the universe. He's big, too big for a human being to be inside of. Right? And the same thing is true with any other, anything that people consider to be God. <clears throat> a human being has to sleep. They have to eat. They have a call of nature. They go to the bathroom. 
Allah is never in need, ever. Not for one second, not for one minute, no time. Does he need food? Does he need water? Does he need our prayers? He don't even need us to pray for him. We pray to him for our own sake. Whether we pray to him or not, he is still Allah. He is still the God. He is still the creator, whether you acknowledge him or not. So nothing that we do can increase him or decrease him. This is the, the reason I'm harboring on this so much is because it is the most important aspect of Al-Islam. As I said, if you get the creator wrong, then you lose your purpose. You don't know what the purpose of your being here is. If you don't understand why the creator made you. So he made you one purpose, and that purpose is to worship him. And when we say worship, a lot of times people take that as just praying to God, right? But worship is every action you do that is righteous. Every action that you do that is not a sin is worshiping God. So me right now, I'm worshiping God. You right now listening, you are worshiping God. Being a good father, being a good husband, being a good friend is worshiping God. So when we say he created you to worship him, he means every action you do that is not a sin is in worship to him. When you help somebody that's homeless, when you, uh, when you help your son or your daughter, when you go to school and you go to work and do something productive, that is a form of worshiping God. The only opposite of that is if you're doing something to harm people. So in general, our worship is the benefit to other people and other things around us. God created us as the successor, the caliph, the leader of this universe and everything around us. So if you plant a tree, you are fulfilling the duty that God has made for you to help and benefit someone else. Maybe it's 10 years, 20 years from now, right? But we are designed to sustain this earth that we are on and to be a mercy to it. So if you are doing what's good and what's right, you are worshiping God. If you are harming something, then you are doing something sinful, whether you're harming yourself or other people. That is the opposite of worshiping God. So everything you do that is harmful to yourself or to other people is what a sin is, right? And we are born, God created us <clears throat> with a rule or, or a, a rule and a nest. A root is your breath that God blew inside of you. And the next is your self, your spirit that is inside of you. So all of us human beings <clears throat> are spirits. We are spirits who are housed inside of this body. And the body is just a vessel, a vehicle to travel around this earth and experience this earth. So we are all spiritual beings. And that spirit that God put inside of each and every human being is pure is righteous. He made you pure. When you were a baby, we don't believe you had a sin upon you, yourself. We believe God made you completely pure. And then it is up to you whether you corrupt that soul or whether you purify it. Now, as human beings, God, Allah, made us with the capacity, with the ability to sin, which means that we will sin, right? God, Allah, has over 99 attributes. We say he has 99 attributes, but actually in the Quran, there are more than 99 attributes. Mm -hmm. They are descriptions, they're names of Allah and how he relates to humanity. So we call him the compassionate, we call him the loving, we call him the most merciful, we call him the forgiving, we call him the pardoner. He cannot show he forgives you unless you sin. Right? So he created us knowing that we have the capacity to do wrong. But our goal, our aim, the reason that we are different from other people is because we feel bad when we do something wrong and we turn back to him. It's called Tauba. So we are on the wrong path. So we, we are trying to get to the straight path to God. And this path is upright. And if we go down the wrong path, it is our job and our duty to turn back. If anybody's ever heard the story of the prodigal son, right? There's two sons. One of them, he stays righteous. He does everything he's supposed to do. And then the other son takes his talents and he goes off into sinning and doing wrong things. And it says, though, that he turned back to God. And when he came back to God, God ran to him. That is the same belief that Muslims have. That you, individually, each and every one of us, are responsible for our own selves. Nobody made you a sinner. Nobody had a sin that is stained upon you, and nobody can die and erase that sin for you. You did it, so you have to be accountable for it. 
And the way you are accountable for it is you ask God for repentance. That's all he needs from you. He wants sincere repentance from you. For you to turn from what you've done wrong and to try to make amends. And we will do this over and over again. This is the, what I want to tell you, especially to you, brother, is that people think, there was a brother who came here a couple of weeks ago, he said he was afraid to come into the mass jail because he thought he wasn't worthy to come into the mass jail. He thought that he had sinned too much. And I tried to explain to him that this house is a hospital, right? We are sick. We are all sinners in here. But the difference is we are asking for forgiveness. We are trying to change. The difference between us in here and people out there is that they are living in sin and not being concerned about trying to change. So you're going to make mistakes. You're going to do something wrong. The reason you come back to the masjid is you ask Allah, please help me. You want to be around people who are God conscious, who think about God all the time. That makes you less likely to sin. That's also why we pray five times a day. Uh, that's the next part of it. So the, I'm sorry, the first part is Allah. Right? That Allah is the most important. And you are bad witnessing that you believe in Allah and that he is all powerful, all wise at all times. The second part of the oath that you will be taking, inshallah, is I bear witness that Muhammad is his messenger. Now that means that he is the last messenger and prophet sent to mankind. Not that he's the first or the only. We believe in all the prophets of God. We believe in Adam, that Adam was, the, was a prophet of God. We believe that Moses and Abraham and, and Aaron and Elijah and Jesus and John the Baptist were all Muslims who believed in this religion of Islam, who taught the same thing that we are teaching. In fact, if you read the Bible, you find that they all prayed exactly as you just saw us praying. They all put their head on the ground and bowed to God. Abraham and his whole household put their face on the ground and prayed to God. Moses and Aaron put their faces down and prayed to God. Jesus in the gap in the Garden of Gethsemane put his face on the ground and prayed to God. In, in the book of Revelations, it says the angels put their faces on the ground and prayed to God. All we are doing is following in the in the same line of the prophets of old. And Muhammad is the last of those prophets. That's why everybody else you see pray in a different manner, but the religion that we have is in the same tradition of those other prophets. And they are his brothers in this religion of Al-Islam. He is just the last of the prophets. So he's here to teach us about Allah, get us back on this straight path. So the human being has a natural inclination, a natural inclination, a natural tendency towards belief in God and belief in one God. But all, every now and then throughout history, we decide that we are smarter than God. And we're smarter than the, 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 than, the, um, than the prophets and messengers. In the human being's effort to, to bring God closer to them, they denigrate and degrade God. They want God to look like them and act like them. So they make a human figure and say, this is God. Or they make a statue and say, this is God. When God cannot, there's no image that you can start drawing of him. As soon as you put the pen on the paper, there's nothing like him. Allah says in the Quran that there is nothing comparable to him. So whatever you imagine, whatever you can think, that is not Allah. Right? So Muhammad is teaching us this. And what, during this month of Ramadan is when this Quran was revealed. And the reason we know these things, the reason I'm standing before you talking the way I am is because of this Quran which was a revelation that was sent down to the prophet beginning during this month of Ramadan. In these last 10 days, the prophet was in Mount Hira, which is a mountain in Mecca. And he was meditating to him, and then an angel came to him and said, Ikra, which means to read or recite. And he started to recite these verses of this book. And over 23 years, he recited all this book, and then they compiled it into what is the Quran today. So this is our holy book. This is also different from any other scripture, any other manuscript. Um, when, when you leave, before you leave, I have a copy of something called the Clear Quran. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave with you. Um, just remind me to give that book to you. It's a translation in English of the Quran. And um, this book was compiled over 23 years with different circumstances, different situations that happened in the life of the prophet. And Allah would give him a revelation to answer the, the questions or the dilemma that was happening during that time. And all of that was compiled into this Quran. Unlike any other manuscript, this, had, this book has been preserved in its original form since, it, since its inception. 
So they are copies of this book and that are, came from the time of the prophet. We can take this book, and put it beside those copies that are written on animal skin and read the exact same words. The same thing cannot be said of other scriptures. Other scriptures have been changed, added to, subtracted from this book. And Allah says it in the Quran that he will preserve this book because this is the revelation for mankind until the end of time. So unlike any other book, we actually have the communication that Allah gave to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi in its unadulterated form. And this is indicative of the fact that he's the last prophet. So if you wanted to follow Moses, you would have to look in the Bible to find the, the books of Moses or the teachings of Moses. But if you study it deeply, you'll find that Moses didn't actually write that book. It's a biography about Moses. If you want to follow Jesus, you can't find the actual writings of Jesus. You'll find full biographies about Jesus. The same thing is true of all the other prophets. This is the only book here that is what Muhammad, the revelation he received. And then in a different book, his biography is there. And then in a different book is his traditions of what he did and what he said and what he allowed to be done. This book is the words from Allah, right? Something different than any other scripture has. The, the Buddhist scripture came hundreds of years after Buddha. The Hindu scripture came hundreds of years after the Krishna, the God Krishna, and all those gods that they have, Shiva. And, uh, Shiva um, incarnated into a man, into a boar, into a man slash lion. I say all this to say there are people who believe in God, but they believe in different incarnations of him. When we believe God cannot incarnate, it's impossible for him to lose his majesty and lose his power and become a human being. Because if he becomes a human being, then he can be crucified. And God can't be crucified. So the next aspect is, I, 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 I get scared when I embrace Allah. I don't, like, I don't even like erasing Allah's name. But it's the most important part of it. The next part is the Salat, which is what we just did. And I'll just give you the, uh, this one. Okay, I'm doing Okay, I'm doing uh, let me know if you need anything. Okay, I hope everything is okay. <clears throat> so the next aspect is salat. So we pray five times a day. It's normally translated as prayer, right? But I like to translate it as worship because it is a form of worship because the, the connotation that people have of prayer is, you know, you have your hands like this, at least in America, you have your hands like this and you ask God for something. Right, when our prayer is more of a ritual. You see, when they when the people came in, those people, the, the sister, the sisters and the brother that came in are from Senegal. Right? And they're praying the exact same words that we are praying. It's, it's a worship. So they speak an entirely different language from Arabic. But the reason that we can I can go to Mecca, the reason I can go to Indonesia, the reason I can go to the Philippines and find a Muslim organization and they all pray the same way is because of this form of worship, this ritual, that we all pray the same in the same way five times a day. So that is called the Salah. We pray directly, we're praying towards the Kaaba, we're praying to God, praying to Allah. And these are words that are uh, designed for us to say. Now if you wanted to say your own prayer, right? If you want to speak in English and you want to say, oh God, oh Allah, help me get this job that I'm trying to get. Oh Allah, help me strengthen my Iman, which means faith. Or you just want to say whatever you want to say to him, that's called du'a. And uh, that's spelled uh, you probably, if you see it online, spell this P, the D U A A. That's a supplication. That's more uh, akin to what we know as prayer. You can say whatever, whenever, whatever time. But it's a lot. It's five different times of the day you have on your phone the schedule, or, or you can look up the schedule when you're supposed to pray. This du'a is at any time. The next thing is zakat, which is. Um, Translated uh, charity. And you, you pay throughout the year 2.5% of your wealth. Uh, this is for all Muslims that are able to, to pay zakat. So you pay that for the poor, you pay that to those people who are in need, those people who are sick, the elderly to the mass year to make sure the mass year is running, all of those things are just 2.5%, right, of your wealth. And then anything other than that is called sadaka. Zakat means charity, but it also means a purification. 
the reason that we pay this and the reason that this is important is because everything that you have, all of your possessions, are not really yours. They are Allah's. Allah has entrusted you with a certain amount of money or a certain amount of time. If you don't have money, your time can also be your zakat. The time that you have spent doing something good, doing something righteous, right? Charity is considered a smile. Me smiling at you while I'm talking is considered a charity because I'm trying, because smiles actually are contagious. You never know somebody like this brother right here, right? Every time he comes in here, he's smiling and happy, right? He makes everybody around him happy. So that is also in this religion a form of charity. So this zakat is, is a, from the bounty that God has given you. Obviously, we can't take this with us, right? So Allah has given us a certain amount of money, a certain amount of time, a certain amount of knowledge. Knowledge is also charity. Everything that you can give to somebody else is a form of charity, right? So outside of this 2.5%, this is also called charity. Uh, you give, if you want to give beyond the 2.5%, whatever else you give is considered subject or extra. And extra whatever you give is to people who are in need, to people that you know that uh, are sick or, or um, anybody that's feeling any difficulty. Your sadaqah your sadaq can be, as I said, a smile to somebody or just spending time with them. There are times when we go speak to the homeless, when we go speak to the elderly. That time is considered a charity. Because you could be doing something else. You could be at home, you could be at home sleep or watching a game or something, but instead you took that time to do something righteous, to help somebody else. And that's what worshiping God is, always to help somebody else. Um, also, Allah says, nothing that you give in charity will be lost. So you should never be concerned about, oh, I think I gave too much, right? Oftentimes, and I'm, I'm, I'm assuming y'all live in the 757 area, you pull up to the light, and somebody got a sign, right? And I'm like, all right, <laughs> give them a little bit of what you have, you know, because whatever you give, you will receive back, you know, so you, you look at it as I'm helping this person, I'm trying to benefit this person in some way, but every light you go to, you might not have <laughs> enough to, to feed everybody or give money to everybody, right? The next one is, um, song, which is uh, fasting. And that is primarily, that is, uh, this song, this fasting is during this month of Ramadan that we are in right now. So this revelation began during the month of Ramadan. So we commemorate the whole month of Ramadan as the day that, or the, the month in which God communicated to human beings for this last time. And during that, we fast from sunrise to sunset. So we don't eat, we don't drink. We don't drink water, we don't eat food, we don't have relations with our wives until the nighttime. And really, this is a form of self-discipline. All, of all of our worships are a form of self-discipline to make you a stronger person mentally and physically. Um, it is, is a, a means of your fortitude, your willpower to be able to say, I'm not gonna eat anything or drink anything between that time. Me right now, my mouth is dry, I got cotton, cotton mouth while I'm talking to you, but I, you get a blessing for doing this, for me trying to articulate this truth to you despite the fact of my hardships. So the harder it is for me, I'm not an Arabic speaking person, Arabic is not my first language, but the difficulty that I do in trying to learn Arabic and articulate it to you, I get double the blessing than somebody who knows Arabic. So we get blessings upon blessings for always trying to help people in any way. So during this month of Ramadan, we're fasting during this time, and we're reading the entire Quran, one part every day, so we can read the entire Quran by, Quran by the end of this uh, month. And it is nothing but a nothing but a commemoration of God's revelation to us, right? So we do all of this, everybody comes together, and at the end of it, we have an Eid or a feast that we will have, inshallah, God willing, uh, on Wednesday or Thursday. So we have a big feast, everybody eats, we give food to the children, we have a good merry time next week. Inshallah, we'll be having this uh, fun together to commemorate the end of the uh, fasting and have a huge uh, meal. And actually, the Eid lasts three days. So uh, it's something that's supposed to be for the kids each day for those, for those three days and for us. Because, you know, you from fasting, I know me personally, I start feeling guilty if I'm eating during the middle of the day because I've been fasting for a whole month. So I feel like, am I supposed to be drinking this water? <laughs> right. But it, it, it is a way to um, 
empathize <laughs> and sympathize with people who don't know when their next meal is coming. There are people you see online in Gaza who are waiting for food to come down, right? Waiting for people to drop food down to them. So they don't know when they are going to be able to eat or when they're not going to be able to eat. I read this book called Serpent of the Law. And it was about Africans who were kidnapped and enslaved and brought to the America, and they were Muslim. They were fasting even though they were enslaved. So I always think of that when I think about how hard it is for me to fast. I'm like, they were forced under the worst conditions in humanity, and they still fasted. I'm just a little hungry. <laughs> you know what I mean? I, I know at 730 I'll be able to eat. They don't know when they'll be able to eat. So if you put that into context, you realize that your little hunger, your stomach hunger is not as bad as what they had to endure and what people are enduring right now in the Congos, in Sudan, all over the world. They don't know when food is coming to them. But we know at 7.30, I can drive over to Captain D's and get me a fish sandwich, right? And the last one is Hajj. And uh, if you were listening to us, we were talking a little bit about going to Mecca. And this is like zakat. This is for people who are financially able to do so. So going to Hajj costs a lot of money. I've never made it to Hajj. Right, Hajj, right now the minimum is about almost ten thousand um, dollars. But if you go to Mecca and Medina throughout the year, it's called Umrah. And Umrah is also in the Quran that you should perform Hajj or Umrah. But Hajj is the bigger and most important pilgrimage. Every year, about 2 million to 2.5 million people come together in this uh, ceremony called Hajj. It's, a, it's the largest pilgrimage in the world. If you've ever seen Malcolm X's movie, you'll see how that pilgrimage transformed him. Because what happens is all of us today, we just pray towards the Kaaba in Mecca, right? But when you get to Hajj and you see all the different nationalities, all the different races together praying, you get a whole nother appreciation when you realize that it's not just us people in here, us 10, 20 people in this mass year. It's not us, uh, the other 20, 30 people at that other mass year, but you see the actual 2 billion people. Well, well you, get a, um, you get an idea of the 2 billion people because at the, at the pilgrimage, I think the most they've had is about 3 million people. But you see all these different nationalities who cannot speak. Most of them can't speak Arabic. They can only say Arabic, the prayers in Arabic. So they're speaking their own language. They're in their own groups together. Uh, the Indonesian community come together. And they all, the sisters all have like a, a green towel around their head. You just, you just at one with them. You realize that you are really one humanity. We are all praying to the same one God. We are all coming there with the goal of pleasure. and The pleasure of Allah. So you really get the feeling of the brotherhood and sisterhood of this dean of Al-Islam. Uh, as I said, it's the largest pilgrimage in, in the world. So Malcolm X initially was in this uh, organization called the Nation of Islam. And upon making the Hajj, this pilgrimage, he realized that there was more Muslims than just the African-American Muslims in America. He realized that there were white Muslims, there were Chinese Muslims, there were all these other different ethnicities of Muslims who were sincerely believing in Allah in the same way he did. So it broadened his scope, it broadened his understanding, and he realized that Al-Islam is encompassing for all human beings. Uh, thinking of this, I remember something that um, when I was a teenager, I was studying religion, right? And I was raised Muslim, born and raised Muslim, and then I had this a bit of an epiphany to try to find out whether what I believe was true. And in doing so, I started studying all the different religions. And I built a criteria of what I thought was true. I said, God has to be one, right? It has to, he has to be all powerful, all wise at all times, never vulnerable, never weak. Because my parents and everybody I know told me this, so I wouldn't accept anything different. They, my mom tried to take me to church and I was like, you told me that God can't be killed. He said he got killed here, right? <laughs> like, you, I, I believe what you said. That makes sense to me that God can't be killed. Now you're telling me this. So I believe that God couldn't be killed or harmed in any way. That was one of my criteria. The other one was that whatever this religion is that is true, it has to be encompassing 
all people, right? It can't be something that's just for the Jewish people or just for Chinese people or just for black people. If God made everybody, it should be something that everybody can accept. And I found out that the religion I was born in, Al-Islam, is the only one that really sincerely looks at it in this way. Because not only is it every human being follows Al-Islam, but every single when the planets are in their orbit around the sun, everything outside of Allah is his creation, and it submits his will to him. And that's when I knew 100% for sure that I was born in this right religion. Right? The difference, I think, though, the good thing about that is I was born in this religion, but I the better thing is you have decided as an adult, you looked at the different options, you weighed different options and said, this one is the right religion. I'm saying it's, it takes more strength, it takes more fortitude to change than be born in it. Right? That's why when you accept this deen, when you take the shahada tamed, your everything you've ever done ever is wiped clean and you start fresh. So when you come up here and take the shot of pain, you'll be the most sinless person in this room, in everywhere, except for other people that's taking the shot of pain at the same time as you, right? Because you are starting something different in your life than everyone else, right? And then from that, you just try to maintain it. When you do wrong, and everybody does, then you just ask a lot for repentance, and you go back to being that same sinless person. That's the good thing about a Muslim, is we know our station, or we should know our station all the time. You know whether you committed a sin or not. You know whether you asked Allah for forgiveness or not. You know whether you were being sincere or not. Right? So you should know what position you were in all the time. You know you need to pray more. You know you didn't miss that prayer. Ask Allah for forgiveness or try to pray that prayer that you forgot. Right? You know that you didn't fast last week, last Saturday, right? Make that prayer up or ask Allah for forgiveness. Forgiveness is mentioned so many times in the Quran. Allah says he forgives all all sin. All sin. All you have to do is be sincere and ask him for, 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 for forgiveness. That's it. Right? And sincerely change, and only you and only Allah knows whether you are sincere. And you may fall a thousand times. It may be something you just weak for. Right? Every time you sincerely ask Allah for forgiveness, he will forgive you. He said, listen, Allah, I know. It's hard. I've been trying. I've been praying. I've been asking for your strength to stop doing this. Right? I really like this. I really like this show I'm watching or whatever it is. I really like this girl or something. Right? You ask Allah for forgiveness and you stay amongst Muslims. Eventually, whatever that is, you'll be able to get away from it. Because you stay amongst people who are like-minded, who are trying and striving to be as righteous as, possible, as they possibly can. So what happens is that at the end of, of judgment, at the end of life, the last days, you'll be before Allah. And everything you said and do will be for you or against you, right? Everything you have not repented from will be against you. If you repent, Allah wipes it away like you never did it, right? It is you as people, human beings who say, hey, remember when I used to rob that bank? Or remember I used to beat this person up, right? Like Allah does not want us to brag about the sins that we commit. He wants us to brag about the good things that we have done, promote those things. So if you say, yeah, I went and fed the homeless last week, that'll encourage this brother or me to say, you know what, maybe I should be out there feeding the homeless also. Because the same thing happens if you say, yeah, I did this thing, I did this bad thing. It encourages other people to do something bad or something wrong. So if you do something wrong, if I do something wrong, you will never know. I'm not telling you, because I'm not promoting you, because I'm, I feel ashamed of it. It's a thing called haya, which means modesty, it also means shame. But if I do something wrong, I'm not gonna tell you. You'll only find out if you saw me doing it, right? Because my point of it is, is, I'm trying to do what's right, I'm trying to fix that. So not only if you commit the sin, but you're also boasting about it, you commit two sins. Now, now you're promoting it. You didn't just do the wrong thing. You told everybody else about it. You made it seem good to do or okay to do because you're doing it. And they think to themselves, well, this brother's doing it. He's telling everybody. Maybe I should. Right? So our goal, our aim is to, when we make it to paradise, to make sure our scale of good deeds outweighs our bad deeds. That's what I mean. Every Muslim should know their station. You should know whether the good deeds you've done, whether they outweigh those bad deeds. And all those bad deeds you can think of, you ask a lot for forgiveness. You try to make amends. If you hurt somebody, you did something to somebody, every Ramadan I try to reach out to people and say, you know, if I offended you in any way, I am sorry. Please accept my repentance. Please, or please accept my, my um, asking for you to accept my repentance, right? I went to um, Africa in October, and I had a couple of 
friends of mine, African American brothers who we had some issues with. I said, listen, I'm about to go to the motherland. I don't want to have any tension with any African American, period, right? So let's go out to lunch. We're going to make amends to any issues we have. The same thing is true for you whenever you feel that was just an opportunity for me to do that. But any moment when you feel like, you know what, I know I've, I've wronged this brother or we having this tension, just ask him, say, listen, can we make amends and stop this, right? Whatever the tension is. If they don't want to, that's up to them. But you try to be your level best to try to fix things. So you know whether your position is you've done the best you can, you've been as righteous as you can, and anything you've done wrong, you ask for repentance for, you ask for forgiveness for, and you will be forgiven. That's in a nutshell what Al Islam is. That's why to me it is the most beautiful religion in the world. It's like you have everything that you already really want in these other religions, right? Except nobody died for it. You are responsible solely for what you do. You, when you go to heaven or hell, it's because of what you did solely and completely, not what anybody else did. Not because you believe somebody else did something for you. Not because you believe that Adam committed a sin and caused you to go to hell. I wasn't there when Adam did it, right? Why would I be punished for it? God punishes you for what you do and you don't make amends for and what you don't ask him to forgive you for. And he made you to do wrong so you can come to him. There's no way he could be the most forgiven if you never did anything wrong. So your nature, he made us with the nature to do things that are not right, but also with the nature of trying to be as righteous as possible. That's why when you see movies, you love that the, the good guy wins, or there's justice in the end, because in our natural state, we want righteousness. We strive for righteousness. That's why people march. That's why people protest. That's why people go to court, and they want their lawsuit to be to be uh, upheld because they want justice. That's what we are seeking. That's what Al-Islam means. Not only submission to the will of God, but it also means peaceful submission to the will of God or the submission to the will of God in order to get peace. Our whole goal is to get peace. That's why we say as alaikum. alaykum. We're saying may peace be on you and may peace be on you and you and you and everyone else. So our goal, our striving, our aim is to spread peace around the world. But we also, I just, I just thought about this because I know as an African-American man, I want to make sure this is clear. We want to spread peace around the world, right? But we are not pacifists. We don't say, turn the other cheek. We don't say, if somebody hits you, then give them your other cheek so they can hit you. We don't say, if somebody steals your coat, then give them, if somebody steals your shirt, give them your jacket also. We say, fight oppression. Allah says in the Quran, oppression is worse than death. Right? If you've ever seen the, uh, the, the, the uh, series Roots, Toby Kutakente actually kept trying to run away because he knows, as a Muslim, he was a Muslim, by the way, he knows that the only person that we serve and we submit to is Allah, not any human being. So there was laws made saying stop kidnapping Muslims because they keep fighting back. Stop, fighting, stop kidnapping Muslims because they keep encouraging every other people to fight back. The, the spirit that Muslims have of that we will only submit our will to the will of Allah is something that cannot be contained. That's why people are coming to Al-Islam in, in droves when they see the people in Gaza. The people in Gaza have rocks. Rocks. And they're fighting people with rockets. And they're still believing in Allah because they know they cannot lose. Them dying, they go directly to paradise for that. Directly. They skip, go and go directly into paradise. Right? Unlike any of us, if you die in the cause of Allah, you die fighting for justice, you go straight to paradise. Right? So that's why they, Israel, they are winning, but they can never defeat those people. Ultimately, they will lose. And that's the same thing with all other Muslims. We can never lose any time ever, because ultimately the justice is with Allah, and they will lose. Uh, any questions? <laughs> <laughs> I always get riled up at the end there. <laughs> um, if you have any questions, if you don't have any questions or anything, we can come and take the Shahada team right now, brother, and that'll be in there. You'll be a Muslim with us. You'll be amongst the other two billion people. If you're ready to do that, alhamdulillah. All right. Well, again, I'm going to say this um, slowly for you to uh, repeat after me. And what I'm, what I'm going to say is, and the translation is, I bear witness that there is no God but Allah, and I bear witness that Muhammad is his messenger. Mm -hmm. So, Ashahadu, Allah, 
illaha illallah ashhadu anna muhammadar rasulullah alhamdulillah brother alhamdulillah you with us now man uh, right now and I say this all the time, you are the most sinless person in this whole vicinity. The only people more sinless than you are people who just took the same oath you did. You are now amongst the two billion people, amongst all the prophets of God who accepted and understood that there is only one God. So this is what I would like for you to do, and I hope that you do, is that don't put too much burden on yourself, right? It's a, it's a hard thing because you are encompassed by people who don't believe in the same religion you do. We make up about 1% of the population. So there's going to be people pulling from you, pulling you in different directions. So don't too, put too much burden on yourself. Learn and do as much as you can because each day you strive to become a better and better Muslim. I didn't become Imam yesterday. It's something that I built up to. You know, you try to be better and better and more righteous and more knowledgeable each day. And then you'll be the Muslim that you are, st are striving to be. Uh, we here are your support system. I'm going to leave you my phone number. You can call me if you have any questions, any concerns. But the purpose of a community is to ensure that you keep this purity as much as you can that you just have right now. Right? So if you feel that you are slipping, you feel like you're down, you feel like you don't understand something, you can call me, text me. I might not get right back to you, but I'm going to get back to you for sure. And I'll get the answer to you to whatever you need. Uh, again, I say it takes great courage to change your course that you've been living in your life. How old are you? 39. 39 years old, right? So for 39 years, you've been going down one path, and now you're saying, I'm going to change this. I'm going to be the Muslim. I want the world to know I'm a Muslim, right? That means that you have decided in your mind and figured out that this is the right path for me, right? And when you do this, you'll be inspiring other people. Other people will see you differently. They may see you differently now. It's something that happens that I find with people that become Muslims. I find that most of them are people who are already righteous and good people already, or people that their family come to for advice, come to for to seek some support. Because as a person who's a good person already, or that nucleus already, Al-Islam just makes you better than what you already are. It just elevates you, right? So whatever you are now, when you accept this religion of Al-Islam, it just improves what you already were. Right? It makes you a better Muslim, a better purchase person, a better worshiper of God. So alhamdulillah, I will do whatever I can to ensure that you stay on this path and that we are your support system and everybody you see here. And if you come on Fridays, I know it's difficult for some people, but our Friday prayers at 1 o'clock, that's when the majority of the people are here. You'll see your brothers and sisters in here. Uh, they will be trying to exchange phone numbers with you so they can be your support system. So call them, reach out to them. Anytime you feel like we'll be able to be um, your backbone, brother. I appreciate you, man, very much. I do. I got Shahada Packet. That's what I'm saying. I'm going to get him the flip of hand, uh, Shahada Packets, all those things. If you wait a few moments, I'll bring all that stuff out to you. Remember that? Yes. Yeah. 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 Oh, okay. Great Oh, oh, that's that. Okay. Yeah, I'm over. Four percent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Four percent. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm in Chelsea. That when I'm over, like, you know, uh, South Side, South North, South North, whatever. Oh, yeah. You know, when you go over. Go down Bramerton, over the bridge by North State. Yeah. You know, as soon as you pass Big Park, Oakley Park, I'm over that, uh, over that way. Okay. So yeah, when you said Tuskegee, I'm like, mm -hmm. like when you go over there, but yeah, you over yeah, well, that side of town. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's gonna be so large. Yeah. Yeah. Like when that's who you born all. Oh. Oh, okay. You get up and around a little bit. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, man. I'm going to tell you.
like I said, they're putting the question right now. Yeah, you've got a lot to, to, to think about. And I'll get a lot of catching up, but just keep that in the back of your mind. Yeah. 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 You're welcome to just fill in and see what's going on. First and third, so you come to me and come back. Out here, so you, if you want something out here, you just have it. from You can have those as well. Yeah, I'm a, okay. And she already got all those books. <laughs> but you can have if if you want to give them to somebody else for sure. You can have some. 